Okay. How you say? Glamour. Glamour. Yeah. <laughs> and before announcement, uh, I'm just waiting for a phone call we might have for those that are interested, a guided tour in the Botanical Garden this afternoon. So whenever I get the, you know, the time and place, I'll put a, a sign. Uh, that'd be fun to, to talk to someone there. So we, we're going to have a real uh, sort of uh, exchange with uh, uh, people in uh, botany. And it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Turelli. Uh, he's at the uh, University of California at Davis. And as I understood, he is, uh, has two hats, one in mathematics and one in uh, biology. And he's the chairman of the, what's the name of the department? Uh, theoretic Ecology? Evolution and Ecology. Evol evolutionary Ecology. And that's the theme of his talk. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And I really didn't understand the nature of this meeting when I prepared my talk. So my talk is on sort of the latest technical advance in this area called evolutionary quantitative genetics. But I recognize now that many of you have no idea what evolutionary quantitative genetics is, so it makes no sense to prepare, present this very technical lecture in this field that, that uh, many of you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. So let me start with some really, just give you some basics. What is this area about? What's the phenomenology? What are we trying to explain? Uh, so the work I'm going to talk to you about today is with my longtime collaborator, Nick Barton. Uh, and you'll see there's, I think, a, I hope when I actually get to the work, you will say, Boy, that was a really trivial talk. That notation that they came up with was so obvious. Well, I, I completely agree. And the only defense I have is that it's taken 90 years to get here. So, uh, so the field of evolutionary quantitative genetics started with Darwin's first cousin, Francis Galton, who was really the father of modern statistics in this entire area called biometry. And Galton, in 1869, wrote this very famous book called Natural Inheritance. And one of the primary observations in this book is that for many characters of interest in nature, like the distribution of leaf lengths in the population, or the distribution of heights, or distribution of weights, or distribution of running speeds, follow approximately a Gaussian distribution. And this was just a bit of phenomenology. Things, many things seem to be approximately Gaussian distributed. Occasionally one had to take a log transform, but things often look pretty close to Gaussian. And what Galton was interested in, what naturally, was his cousin's theory of evolution by natural selection. And central in that theory is the relationship, the phenotypic relationship, the similarity between relatives, in particular between parents and offspring. So what Galton did was to invent this field of quantifying. He's the first man to systematically apply mathematics and biology. He invented this field of systematically quantifying relationships among relatives and came up with empirical rules for the similarity between relatives, showing that more distantly related individuals tend to, tended to show less phenotypic similarity. Okay. That's where the field sat for about 40 years. In 1900, Mendel, so Mendel who had worked in the 1850s, his work was rediscovered by the scientific community only in 1900. And it was a major conceptual problem to reconcile the observations of the biometricians, starting with Galton, with the work of the Mendelians. Could you reconcile continuous variation with discrete genes? And Fisher, R.A. Fisher, who so found the man who really elaborated modern statistical theory, uh, elaborated a suggestion, uh, suggestion from Punnett and Yule showing that you could reconcile the two if you assumed that characters like height and weight are governed by a large number of factors that are approximately additive in their effects. And those factors are of two sorts. 
there are genetic factors. So if you look at any trait of variation, you know, look at the shapes of our ears in this population, that variation is governed by, it turns out empirically, a large variation at a large number of genes plus environmental effects. So you don't look the way you do just because of your genes. Your environment of all sorts also has a major impact. But the fact that there was this underlying structure of contributions for many things, and the fact that observations were at least roughly consistent with those factors adding up, at least the genetic factors adding up, it was, if you like, a folk application of the central limit theorem saying, well, obviously, you get a Gaussian distribution. Everybody knows if you add things up that are more or less independent, you will get a Gaussian distribution. So that was the beginning of evolutionary quantitative genetics. So basic idea, additive model, add things up, use the central limit theorem, you reconcile the Gaussian distribution of phenotypes. Um, Fundamental in this talk will be the idea of decomposing variation. So Fisher, R.A. Fisher, invented the analysis of variance. Why did he invent the analysis of variance? Specifically to solve this problem, to understand the decomposition of phenotypic variance, of phenotypic variance into genetic effects and environmental effects. And what we mean by the analysis of variance is just that the phenotypic variance is the variance of the average phenotype given a genotype plus the average variance of the phenotype given genotype. What does this mean? So this is what the analysis of variance is in sort of the language of mathematical statistics or probability theory. If you know the genotype of an individual, what's its average phenotype? Okay? That's what we call the genotypic value. Okay? So, so this inner expectation is taking over everything but the genotype, and the outer measure is the measure of the distribution of genotypes in the population. So this bit is what we call genetic variance. And this bit, the average variance of phenotypes given genotypes, even if I know if you have identical twins, for instance, those identical twins will look different from one another. There'll be phenotypic variance. And the average of those phenotypic variances conditional on genotypes, that's what we call environmental variance. Okay. Well, this genotypic variance piece can be further decomposed. So if I say many genes contribute, all higher organisms are diploid, so you inherit two copies of the genes, one from your father, one from your mother, and those contributions uh, are coming from many genes. Okay? So we can decompose the genetic variants into contributions attributable, if you like, to main effects of individual alleles and to interaction effects within loci, and that's what we call dominance effects and interaction effects across loci, which we call epistasis. So it was recognized instantly by Fisher. Obviously, these genes don't add up. There are a few examples where we know they do add up, famous examples of pigmentation. At least in some plants, we know and understand why the intensity of color, say, from, from white to red, we have many loci that contribute to red pigment, the more alleles you have, the more individual genes that contribute to red pigment, the more red you are. So, and human skin color is not so different from that. Largely additive contributions from, from many loci. But Fisher instantly recognized that loci would also interact. Uh, and it's not clear how that interaction relates to the central limit theorem stuff. Okay, and there are many things that don't quite hang together mathematically. And I think that's a hallmark of a lot of interesting biomathematics, that the phenomena we're trying to explain, we can, in, in the best of all possible worlds, make some useful predictions with the toy models. But if you poke at it hard as a mathematician, you'll see that none of the so-called theorems or these equations that people use are really equations. They're just useful approximations. So that's really the way all this stuff works. <laughs>
the most fundamental approximation in evolutionary quantitative genetics is how do populations respond to natural selection. And the folk theorem, and this is extraordinary. I, I, I wonder if there is any other field where the central equation never does not have a name associated with it. The equation of the field, no one takes credit for it. It turns out, so let me explain the fundamental equation. It's that the change in the mean field, so this, so z bar is my z is my character, z bar is the mean. Delta z bar is the change in the mean between generations. So you have the parental generation, you have the off parental generation and the offspring generation. So natural selection makes some individuals produce more offspring than others, and we can take the average of the individuals, say, who survive versus the, uns the mean of the unselected population, and that's called a selection differential. And we want to know, given that you do some selection, like the famous Darwin's finch example, only the birds with the biggest beaks were able to eat the hard seeds. So the big drought, only big seeds were available. Many birds died. The only ones that survived were the ones with the biggest beaks. Okay? How different were their offspring? Well, the equation that predicts how different their offspring would be is this equation. The change between generations is the change within generations times this magical quantity, heritability. And what heritability is, is the fraction of the total phenotypic variance attributable to what we call additive genetic effects. And I'll explain that in more detail once I start my lecture pro properly. So this quantity, heritability, and this quantity, additive genetic variance, play sort of a profound role in evolutionary quantitative genetics. Natural selection can only be effective because there's additive genetic variance available. And it's not mysterious. Why additive genetic variance? Because the only things that you get from your parents, they only give you individual genes. They don't give you their genotype. So it's only those effects, those main effects associated with alleles as opposed to combinations of alleles that pass between generations. So it should be, in some sense, intuitive that the additive bits are the most important. Okay. One last bit of background, and I'll start my talk. There are several important, there are several. There are two fundamental theories in evolution, and uh, you know, in truth and advertising, most of the fundamental theory, a lot of the fundamental theories in evolutionary biology are complete crap. I mean, people just make up stories, the stories get repeated, the stories are, comp are consistent with a little bit of data, and they become part of the wisdom of the field, and they'll be part of the wisdom for 50 years before anybody points out, you know, there's no support for that theory. That theory is really silly. So there's two theories I will talk about. I think, unfortunately, both fall into that category. Um, and these both concern what happens to the additive genetic variance when populations get small, when you when something happens that dramatically reduces population size, like a population of small number of immigrants gets to an island, like the first few Galapagos finches get out to the Galapagos, or some catastrophe happens and only a very few individuals survive. Okay? It is conjectured that under those circumstances, magical things can happen. And that's really the appropriate fra phrase. The argument, and there's some experimental support, is that, and you can show this in the laboratory, that when you make populations small, it is occasionally true that the additive genetic variance goes up. Since additive genetic variance is what selection depends on, you might think, OK, that could be something special. We should worry about that. So the talk I'm going to give is about the technical conditions under which additive variance will increase when you re drastically reduce the population size. Okay? And I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to show you results that are more general than anyone has ever gotten about that question. And we were able to get more general results than anybody else because we have a better notation. And it's really all about notation and a couple of clever calculations. And the clever calculations are attributable to my pal, Nick Barton, okay, more or less. Uh, 
I corrected a few mistakes, but, but Nick had really clever ideas. Uh, so the history of the field in terms of thinking about epistasis, R.A. Fisher, 1918, introduced the idea of epistasis. It was first analyzed at all for many genes uh, in terms by Clark Cockerham and Oscar Kempthorne, both, both of whom became very well known based on this work in 1954. The field just sat there uh, in terms of this notation. The notation is extremely cumbersome. Why? So what's the problem? The problem is, so you have two, so let's just consider the case where we have n genes, n loci contributing to the character, and two variants. So these, these two guys are the alleles, and these are the alleles at different loci, okay? Loci places on the chromosome that, enco that encode for these characters. In a diploid, every individual has two alleles. So there are three to the n genotypes. Three to the n genotypes, just with two variants. Okay? So it's some notational problem to worry about how to describe all the possible interactions be between those genes in a compact way that lets you make sense of what's going on. The initial notation that people came up with was so cumbersome that they really couldn't do anything beyond thinking about two locus interactions, because that was already ugly enough. And I'll show you, we have a notation that allows you to do any number of loci without breaking a sweat, really. A comparable notation was recently developed by Hansen and Wagner, uh, two colleagues. Uh, who got some interesting results, but results unrelated to the results I'll be presenting. But it's interesting, so we just submitted this paper for publication, and Hansen was one of the reviewers, and their notation is so complicated that even Hansen didn't realize that their notation was equivalent to our notation in the case of two alleles. So I'll just leave it there. Our notation is, is much simpler. Okay, so I apologize for the long introduction, but I think it was necessary to give you some, you know, if you don't get nothing else out of the talk, hopefully you know something about, you know, what the hell was this guy talking about. Okay. Gold provide a general description of epistasis that actually produces interpretable expressions, interpretable expressions for additive effects, dominance effects, and interaction effects. What gets complicated is that those interaction effects can involve interactions of different orders. And those interactions can be within loci and across loci. And you need some way to keep track of those different kinds of interactions because they can have different effects. And I'm gonna cheat in this talk, and even though I tell you that all organisms you care about, except for E. coli, and uh, have our diploids have two copies of each chromosome. It's so complicated doing that notation that I'm going to concentrate on the haploid case, which shows you all of the qualitative effects that we're going to get here. I'll use that representation to show how each variance component changes with allele frequency changes. I'll analyze the consequences of allele frequency changes uh, produced by genetic drift. And there's actually some mathematics here. So there's a very pretty use of systems of stochastic differential equations to solve this problem. No way there's time to present any of that. But I'll put a manuscript on the web server so you can see how we've done it. I'll use, and this is, this is it. Use a diffusion approximation to bound the errors for a particular assumption I'm going to make to simplify the calculation. So we'll have an error bound, make an approximation, do an error bound, and then derive analytically conditions under which this experimental observation would be expected to be true. And then I probably won't get here, but we also have used this notation to analyze a model of the most extreme type of epistasis interaction imaginable. That is where you do a random mapping of all the 3 to the n genotypes onto phenotypes. So you just pick those things IID, so you have extreme interactions, and we can analytically analyze that model uh, to show that a prediction that was made is true, but true. So 
a lot of the analysis in this field, because the mathematics is so daunting, the algebra is so daunting, algebra in the high school sense, not in the mathematical sense, but because the algebra is so daunting, most of this field is done numerically. People just do computer simulations, and we can do it all analytically and show that what these guys conjectured from numerical results are in fact true, but they're true for a trivial reason. They claimed that this phenomenon of additive variance increasing with a bottleneck would be more likely to occur if more genes contributed to the character. That in fact turns out to be true, but it's true for a trivial reason, not for the reason that there's some interesting interaction between drift and the number of loci, but just that, because that the number of loci does something to the components of variance. Now, I'll explain that. Yeah, so unfortunately, there's just no way around it. I mean, you need a lot of notation. So the loci, the genes that contribute, will be labeled I, J, K. Um, we need indicator random variables to tell us which allele. So naturally, the alleles are going to be called 0 and 1, and we need indicator variables to tell us which allele we're looking at. In the haploid case, we would just have xi, so 0 or 1, for locus i. In the diploid case, we use this double struct notation, uh, where we call this a position. It's also equal to 0, 1, where the position means im versus if. Um, the allele was inherited from the mother or the allele was inherited from the father. So I'll sometimes you'll see this double struct notation and I'll talk about positions. Just think, just think loci because I'm not going to do the diploid case in any detail. Something that, the, that you really have to sort of keep straight here is that I'm going to be talking about three levels of randomness in this talk. It's like there are three relevant measures. One. Um, measure capital E will be expectations over the distribution of genotypes in a population. Okay? So what I have are these N loci. Okay? At each locus, I can call the alleles capital AI and little ai. The frequency of this is PI. And the frequency of capital AI is always, you know, is QI, 1 minus PI. So I have this variable population, and I'm going to assume just as a simplification, and it's a simplification that we expect to be true because of the laws of inheritance, that the appropriate measure over these things is a product measure, that we have no associations across loci as to whether the 1 or the 0 allele is present. That's a major simplification. Um, so PI is the average of the indicator random variable. So again, E is the expectation over the distribution of genotypes in the population. Linkage disequilibria. What are linkage disequilibria? They are associations of the genotypes across loci. So as I said, as an approximation, I'm generally going to assume those away. But that's not true. Genes are inherited on chromosomes. The, chromoso the genes are physically linked and tend to be inherited as blocks. Okay? But it turns out that the, the processes of sexual reproduction with recombination, so-called crossing over, drives everything towards linkage equilibrium where there's no associations. But if you're going to analyze seriously the effects of finite population size, where you have sampling of chromosomes in a finite population, even if you start with no associations, there will be a transient buildup of association that is then decayed through sexual reproduction. Okay? And so what our diffusion approximation that I'm not going to present about, about is bounding the error that we make by assuming that you're always at the product measure. So the measures that we use 
the measures that we use for associations first involve considering these deviation variables, the size, which is just the indicator random variable minus its expectation. So these are the fundamental variables that we use over and over again. And we'll take products of those deviations across sets of positions or across sets of loci u. So the problem here is keeping track of these associations across arbitrary sets and keeping track of interactions across arbitrary sets. Um, so our measure of association across a set, so-called multi-locus disequilibrium, is just the expectation of those deviations, the product of those deviations. So when I put one of these variables with a set under it, that just means the product over the elements in that set. So for instance, if I was talking about a trait in a haploid population, so one chromosome from each parent, and that trait was only governed by two genes, the relevant positions would be uh, one and two, and the associations would be D1, D2, and D12. And by definition, uh, if I define these reference points to be the current allele frequencies in the population, the expectation of this random variable uh, minus its expectation would be zero, the expectation of that difference. Okay? Now, the key idea in this notation, well, let me. So here's the central idea, and as I say, I hope this seems uh, pretty obvious. The central idea is that we can represent the genotypic value, and we're going to ignore environmental effects. Environmental effects just are noise on top of this and can be dealt with easy, easily. The problem is dealing with the interactions among genes. We want to know how you go from a genotype to a phenotype. So what is that mapping, genotype, phenotype mapping, and how can you express that mapping in a way that lets you do calculations that you might care about? And so in the haploid case, let's just think about the haploid case, we have uh, two to the n possible genotypes. For every one of those genotypes, you know, we got to have the string of indicator random variables, and they're all zeros and ones, and I say we could represent we could represent any specific genotypic value as the mean phenotypic value in the population plus a sum over all possible subsets, so this is basically simple combinatorics, of a set of coefficients, constants, scalars, associated with those sets of positions times the deviation of this product of deviations minus its mean. And this is just a simple representation, sort of clearly true. We have the same number of degrees of freedom both sides, and it's easy to construct a recipe to calculate those coefficients. The important thing to recognize, and this is true in about everything in quantitative genetics, is that the coefficients that you get in this representation depend on the reference points you use to define those deviations. And different reference points are useful in different calculations. So in many calculations, the most useful reference point for each of these, uh, for each of these uh, indicator random variables, you want to expand around its current expectation. So the expected value of xi is pi. And if you do the expansion around the current allele frequencies, all of these d's are 0. So the important thing to recognize is that these coefficients depend on where you are. Okay? And what's useful about our notation is once you've written it this way, think, think about it as a combinatorial problem, it's easy to see what the relationships are among the b's that you get when you use different, different reference points. So the point is you take a population, you make it small, you're going to have random deviations at all of these loci, and those deviations can be approximated by a diffusion. And you want to know, if I had some initial value for BA, what's going to be the new value? So we're going to have different reference points, initial allele frequency, final allele frequency. What is the change in the coefficient, what are the changes in the coefficients of these expansions, of this expansion here, that will allow us to do some calculations? 
So I don't want to belabor this point. I mean, it's really simple combinatorics. You just do what comes naturally. Uh, if you start with some p and you want to think about some other deviations associated with some new allele frequencies, you just substitute what the new allele frequencies are, the new deviations, into our general expression. And you can get a new set of Bs in terms of the old sets of Bs. And the way you do that, to explain the notation, the new B star U, okay, so this is the effect associated with loci in this set U, okay, is gotten by looking at the old coefficients, where you take the set U and add to it all possible subsets of Z that weren't included in U. So everything else, and this is just a simple combinatorial argument to tell you that that's true, and ask how different are the allele frequencies. So you take the old Bs involving, so if you're interested, for instance, in Bi, the additive effect at a particular locus, I, this says that Bi star is going to be the summation over all j not equal to all, set, all sets u, uh, excluding i, all sets u excluding i, b u i, delta p u, where this is just interpreted as the product of the changes over all loci in the set u. This is what allows us to do all of the calculations in a simple way. And what will be fundamental is that the frequencies in this set U, okay, as a good approximation, will be independent of these frequencies in all these sets V that did not include U. So the fundamental approximation is that the fluctuations that occur at different loci are statistically independent. Okay? That's what makes everything go down the road. Okay. Yeah. So our simplifying assumptions, so in, in population genetics terms, we call this Hardy-Weinberg linkage equilibrium. That just means product measure. And at that, all these expectations of these deviations are zero, and we have this more simplified notation. Yeah. Now here's where the rubber meets the road. Why is this a useful notation? So let me try to explain this, just to give you some sense of why this notation is any good. In some sense, this is... I claim, in, in a very particular sense, this is the natural representation of the system. Because those coefficients b tell us about precisely the effects associated with a particular level of interaction. So I'm going to define, yeah, so, central so these are the central quantities in evolutionary quanti quantitative genetics. The average deviation from the population mean so one thing you want to know is, by how much will an individual deviate from the population mean if all you know about that individual is that it carries the one allele at one set of loci and it carries the zero allele at another set of loci, okay? You don't know all of its genotypes. So these two sets, S1 and S0, need not be the entirety of Z. You can only say, all I know about this individual, there are 10 loci that govern the character, and all I know is it had, at the fourth of those loci, it has a zero allele. What can I say about how much that individual will deviate on average from indivi other individuals in the population? So that just involves computing conditional expectations, and all of this is quite trivial, it's just a lot of notation. Uh, Yeah. So let me not try to beat through this. The conditional expectation, given that you have zeros in that set, zero alleles in that set, one alleles in that set, minus the population mean, and it just turns, takes a couple of minutes to see this, 
is just a sum over all subsets of those of the B coefficients times the relevant allele frequencies. So P is the frequency of the one allele, Q is, is the frequency of the zero allele, and you take products of those things. And this turns out to be the average deviation. Okay. Now, the second fundamental quantity is how much of the deviation associated with a particular sets of positions cannot be explained by interactions involving subsets of those positions, i.e., how much of it is an interaction at the order of all of those things interacting. Can't be explained. So if you're looking at three alleles, how much of the deviation in phenotype is not explained by the main effects, one, two, three, of the three alleles, or by the pairwise interactions? So that's what we mean by the third order interaction. Same thing as analysis of variance, standard analysis of variance. Well, in this representation, you see that the deviation associated with any position, set of positions, is the sum over all subsets. It's a, so included is the term where this, the term T0 equals S0, T1 equals S1. That's the highest order term. All of these other terms in this sum are the lower order interactions. So just looking at this, you instantly pick out what is the relevant term involving the highest order interaction? It's just B, T0, T1. So these B things that I introduced, I say, let's just represent it this way, turn out to be the natural way to represent the interactions in these systems. And as usual, finding the, the right coordinate system lets you do calculations easily. Yeah, so I define these effects associated with the highest order interaction to be just those things. We, not we define, we can calculate them to be that. And so when I talk, now I can think about a, defining a random variable over a set of positions uh, where, it's a, where the measure on that is the distribution of genotypes over those positions in the set S. Okay. And so that random variable, alpha S0, would take on the value S0, alpha S0, S1 with this probability. Okay. So it's trivial to show that those deviations all have expectation zero, the deviations after all. And the variance associated with interactions at that level turned out to be trivial to represent as just a square of that appropriate coefficient times the product over the sets, over the loci in that position times the allele frequency, the product of the two allele frequencies, P times Q. Okay. So in particular, what's called the additive genetic variance, this magical quantity in population gen and quantitative genetics plays a fundamental role in selection response, is trivially represented as bi squared pi qi. And the question is, if the allele frequencies now change at random due to the genetic drift, under what conditions will that go up? Yeah. Well, the first thing I can do in this notation, let me not beat this. This is sort of an embarrassment. So the, the, manus, the manuscript describing this to colleagues who are professionals is about 80 pages long. Uh, so I, I'm sorry. There's just a lot of it. But I'll just hit the highlights. Let me just say that in our notation, we can describe the variance attributable to interactions of any particular order in a trivial way as just a sum of the squares of the coefficients over sets of that order times the product of the PQs. Just leave it there. And now I want to ask, if the allele frequencies change, what does that do to statistics that you can measure experimentally, like the mean of the population 
and how much genetic variance there is in the population. Okay. Uh, so the change in the mean, it takes a minute to show, is just what the initial coefficients are times the changes in the allele frequencies. And if we assume that the population is at linkage equilibrium, you can show that the new genetic variance in the population is by definition BU squared PQU. And we can define this piece uh, in terms of just what the changes are in P and Q. And you see it de it'll depend on knowing what this product is, the product of changes of the allele frequency and the square of allele frequencies over a whole bunch of loci. Okay. So even if you think about one generation, and the standard statistical model for this, so-called Wright-Fisher model, is that you have binomial sampling each generation. So if you continue binomial sampling over several generations, the natural thing to do is a diffusion approximation, and it's, and it's uh, turned out to be an extraordinarily useful approximation in this context. And I'll, sh I'll show you some numerical results that support it. Yeah. Okay. So I have to explain a little bit more elementary population genetics to you. So how to, so we have to introduce a new expectation now, a new, a new set of measures that's of int that are of interest. S these uh, angled brackets, that will be over the distribution of changes in allele frequencies associated with this bottleneck effect, associated with changes in population size. Okay? So E is expectation of the genotypes, the angle brackets, will we be expectations over the changes of allele frequencies associated with the stochastic, the stochastic changes in all these allele frequencies. Okay. What, does, what does this process do? We're assuming no natural selection. On average, allele frequencies don't change. It's fair sampling. Okay. On average, the square of the change, this just follows from the binomial distribution, can be approximated by a quantity that we'll call F times PQ where F is just a cumulative measure, but let me, let me do it here. PQ so PQ is the frequency PI, PQI, frequency AI times the frequency of little ai. So this is a measure of how much variance there is in the population, how much variation there is. Its maximum, obviously, is uh, a quarter, and its minimum is zero. Okay? So it's a measure of how much variation there is at the ith locus. On average, what genetic drift does is drive frequencies towards zero and one. So if you keep doing random sampling, zero and one are absorbing boundaries. On average, one round of sampling, you can show, if you take a finite population, so if you make, make P star binomial, let me put it here where people can see it. So the simplest case to think about is one generation. And the standard model is P star is one over N times binomial. NP. So the number, if you draw a sample of size n, n is our population size, from a population whose allele frequency is p, the new allele frequency is that binomial random variable divided by n. That's p star. Okay? So it's trivial to show that in this case, pq star is going to be pq 1 minus 1 over n in a haploid population, in a diploid population, it's 2n. We represent in population genetics the cumulative effects of a large number of generations of this type of sampling by a coefficient that we call f. So in general, pq star equals pq 1 minus f. So f is just a cumulative measure of how, mu of how much genetic drift has gone on. You can show in the diffusion limit uh, 
that over any, any, over any set of distinct positions, the average over genetic drift is zero. What's less trivial is what to do with products uh, of repeated indices there. So if we worry about what's the average of the, so on average for a haploid, the population mean isn't going to change, but what's the variance in the population? Well, the variance in the population is going to be related to the initial coefficients and products of these changes over sets, okay? And those turn, turn out to be not so trivial to calculate. With our approximation that we have independent changes across lows, now they become much easier to approximate. And what we have are numerical bounds on how bad that approximation can be. So if you look at pairs, we can ask, what is the true expectation of the product of the squared change at the ith locus times the squared change at the jth locus in comparison to this thing that's much easier to think about, the product of the squared changes? The worst that ratio can be is 1.3. It's always one or bigger. It turns out an upper bound is 1.3. So and it turns out that's really a very generous upper bound. It can get there, but be under biologically not very realistic circumstances. And we can do similar bounds for triples of loci and, and quartets of loci. The bounds get higher, but you'll see that it's, they're still in a range where we're not terribly embarrassed by assuming this product measure. So, that allows us to approximate these sort of nasty things in terms of products of what's going on in individual loci, which is what makes everything work. Okay. I won't say any more about the details, but just tell you what the answers are. So, we can now analytically compute, at least for the haploid case, the variance in the change of the population through drift and it turns out to be beautifully represented in terms of the components of variance in the initial population. So. so this is a pretty result. So initially we have VG, VA, VA2, so let me call this VA1 plus Okay. So we've divided the genetic variance in the populations in the components attributable to main effects, pairwise interactions, triples of interactions. I say the variance in the population mean can be expressed beautifully in terms of this one number, this inbreeding coefficient so-called, and all those individual components. A uh, harder calculation uh, involves getting how each of those individual variance components changes. So here's a nice expression for how the total variance changes, again involving the individual components and just powers of the single parameter. So all of this is, ex and what's nice about this is all this stuff is experimentally estimable, and this actually explains experimental results. Uh, and the one that people care, the component that people, so we have an, ex, an analytical expression for how each individual variance component changes, simple combinatorial arguments, again in terms of one experimentally estimable parameter, and these components of the initial variance estimable. In particular, the additive variance is 1 minus F VA plus, okay, in a population with only additive effects, so this is why this result was initially surprising. So with only additive effects, VA star is 1 minus F VA. That in general, genetic drift decreases additive genetic variance, sorry, the expectation of VA star. 
the expectation of VA star is 1 minus FVA. What was observed, exper so you know, where does all this come from? Again, what was observed experimentally in this very influential ex set of experiments in the 1980s is that under some circumstances, VA star was bigger than VA. So you could say trivially, well, it's a random variable, so of course sometimes it's going to sometimes it's going to be bigger than its expectation and sometimes it can be even bigger than that. But under some circumstances it seemed not only was that true, but it also seemed to be that that was true and there was no general explanation for it. Well now we can get a general explanation for it in terms of the components of variance in the initial population. So in the additive population it goes down, but in a population with interactions we have these additional positive contributions. So you could ask, trivially, under what circumstances is that expectation bigger than VA? And roughly speaking, you need at most two-thirds of the variance in the initial population to be attributable to additive effects. At least one-third of the initial variance has to be attributable to interactions. Okay, so you get a simple guideline for that to be true. What's not at all obvious, and I, yeah, if I can derive it in about 10 minutes, and it turns out to be surprising that such a general result is true, but we, I can show using this notation that in general, with interactions, with interactions of any sort involving any number of loci, it's always true that VA star is bigger than 1 minus F VA. That interactions always lead to an increase over the expectation in the absence of interactions. And maybe that's obvious for physicists that maybe you know, people who are used to thinking about things like this say, yeah, of course. But in any way, that's never been obvious to anybody and there's never been any, pr any proof of it, let alone a general proof of it for any number of loci. So let me just say one more thing. Yeah, well, a couple more things. <laughs> I've just presented the haploid case. All of this goes through with diploidy, but the, the notation is much, much uglier. And in a haploid case, everything's beautiful because everything is expressible in terms of these variance components in the initial population that are experimentally estimable. Once you allow for diploidy, and it's not, I would have to beat through the notation to show you why this is true, you can no longer express things in terms of the variance components in the initial population. You can only do that in, in various asymptotic limits. In a limit, for instance, where you ha don't have much, where f is near zero, you can approximate things. And so it turns out that the interactions that are relevant are not only the interactions between loci, the so-called epistatic interactions, but also interactions within loci. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm, going to, I'm not going to do the random model. I just want to show you some pictures. So has this guy been up here bullshitting, or is this the truth that he's been telling you? That's the question always, right? So I, pre so I presented some approximations. Are any of these approximations any good? What the hell is he talking about? So the standard is let's simulate a population, put that population through a bottleneck, do real multi-locus genetics. So they say, I'm making this approximation saying that changes at different loci are statistically independent. That's not true. So how bad is that approximation? So here I'm comparing, here I'm comparing in a population of 100 individuals, 100 individuals where there are five loci, um, I'm going to average over yeah, sorry, 50 individuals go for 200 generations and do 100 simulations, okay? Population size 50, simulate for 200 generations of this stochastic process, then average over 100 simulations, compare my analytical predictions with the mean of the simulations, right? 
no, no reason to resign in disgrace, right? Not a bad approximation. So the prediction for the additive variance goes like this. Here's the average of the 100 simulations. The prediction for the pairwise interaction goes like this. Here's the average for the simulations. Three-way interactions, four-way interactions, five-way interactions. Uh, this is the more difficult case involving uh, diploidy. Again, more and more extreme inbreeding. The additive variance is going down. This is the prediction. If there were no interaction effects, this is our analytical prediction uh, with interaction effects. These are the average of 100 simulations. No statistically significant difference between those numerical data and, and the predictions. Okay. So last. Uh, <laughs> Should anyone care about these predictions? So these predictions are cool because several, so a huge study was just done where this guy actually did 100 populations. So he did the computer simulation with real organisms. Okay? And what he observed experimentally was this, but he had no explanation for it whatsoever. He said, that's plausible in terms of some simulations. Well, now we can show. Well, it's, you know, it's, it as, absolutely has to be true. But are these expectations a useful guide to anything you would see in nature? Okay. <laughs> so everything I've shown you up to this point was the average over 100 replicate simulations. Well, how much variation is there among the replicates? So these are what the real data would look like from individual experiments. And there's the mean. So this is among the reasons I'm, you know, in some sense, quite proud of this work, and in another sense, think it's quite silly. Because I think people have taken these expectations far too seriously in terms of explaining data, because the phenomena they care about are inherently so stochastic that it's not at all clear, unless you do like this poor bastard did in 100 experiments and take the average over them, that's all you really know how to predict. Uh, so blah, blah, blah. Uh, conclusions. On average, VA will tend to increase under drift in expectation if at least one third of the initial variance is not additive. Um, under the, this is what I didn't present. Under a random model, you can show that VA is more likely to increase as a number of loci increases, but that's a trivial consequence of as the number of loci in increases, more of the variance goes into epistatic components. And there's a simple analytical uh, representation for that. Even though, and this is, now I'm speaking to evolutionary biologists who aren't here, but <laughs> even though epistasis is pervasive in nature, and even though uh, VA may increase, that doesn't make either of these theories that invoke this more plausible the so-called shifting balance theory for adaptation or Myers genetic revolution theory for speciation. Uh, but <laughs> this framework, I think, will be extremely useful to answer large classes of questions involving interactions among genes. That's it. Thank you very much. Yes. And can you do it, all this, this uh, selection? Um, Let's say in all the 80 pages. Yeah. I pro what we, so what we'll do next, Carl, is do the interaction between selection and all of this epistatic yeah. stuff. Put it together, selection, epistasis, and drift, that's going to be a hard problem. That's a seriously hard problem. I mean, <laughs> this is, that will take that'll take that'll take a few years to sort out all those inter how all of that fits together. But we can it won't you know in a, in a year or so we can sort out everything with selection with these arbitrary interactions. But the next level will be more difficult. Come on. Yeah. Well,
Yes? Well, yeah, so transposable elements are fundamental, it turns out, in genetic variants in natural populations. So these transposable elements, for those of you who don't know, are these bits of DNA that can mobilize themselves within the genome or with the help of other elements jump around the genome. And since places they jump are at least occasionally controlling elements for other genes or they jump into other genes, they can really produce genetic variants. And like the first, the classic variants of genetics, the white mutation studied by, in the Morgan lab, was attributable to a transposable element. So in some sense, I think, obviously, yes, because a lot of the initial variants that we're talking about here are attributable to transposable elements. So if you're thinking of some circumstance where you've changed the condition so that transposable elements are mobilized, you'd have to superimpose on this framework, say, increases in mutation rates. And I didn't have mutation in here, but that would not at all be hard to incorporate. That would. So I should say, this is building on wor work that Nick and I have done, looking at selection and mutation for arbitrary numbers of genes with complex patterns of interaction. So in some sense, we've done a lot of those calculations already. So yes. <laughs> I can, Maybe a question, I don't know. Uh, as I understood, uh, those averages, uh, they are sort of measured in a uh, phenotypic level, as in, in, in the Darwin Galton sense, like size. The, char the, the fundamental characters are right. phenotypes. And uh, where the more basic uh, genes, they come sort of in some underlying sort of uh, uh, thing that you, the statistics, you, you don't care too much, but you, you put in, in this genetic drift term. But see, it's a, so what we're trying to do, here's, here's a way to think about it. We're trying to do a gas law and worry about what the individual particles are doing. So our calculations are worrying about the movements of the alleles at the individual loci, but our predictions are at the level of the phenotype that you can observe. So that's exactly what the game is here. We have the stuff that we observe. There's this other stuff, the individual alleles and what they're doing that we can't observe in general. And we want to see if we can make observable predictions in terms of all these individual motions that we don't see. So that, uh that comes then my question in, 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 in the light of uh, yesterday's talks by Paulo. Uh, for instance, uh, is it possible to, to try to, to build up toy models in which you would like make these string bits, but you have to sort of make some uh, additive sort of uh, calculations out of the, the several strings? Sure, yes. So that making these additions, maybe you, you could sort of make these speciations and the effect of these bottlenecks. So, yeah. So speci <laughs> speciation is one of the few areas of evolutionary biology where we know interactions are essential to understanding what's going on. And this was Theodosius Stubjanski's insight in 1936 that if you have isolated populations, those populations will change at different loci. And those changes, because they're in separate populations, need not be compatible with one another. So the reasons we see, most of us believe, the reasons we see inviability or sterility when we do hybrids is because of epistatic between locus interactions of changes that have occurred at different loci. So in terms of the model presented yesterday, a simple way to change that model to get closer to these sorts of ideas would be to call these things new species once they've accumulated what you will define as incompatible changes. So it would be interesting to see how those, those, spe those statistics about species would change when you thought differently about how species arise. So yes, I mean, these, the two things could definitely talk to one another. Is there any more? Thank the speaker and we're gonna need a